All right, Chaplain Bob here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Turn your King James Bible to Isaiah chapter 5. This is, there's not much for a commentary. I'm just going to read it. And then um, we'll find out a little bit about thorns. There's not much, there's not going to be much commentary on this, but a little bit on thorns. So, verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it. Now, why would you fence it? Well, you want to keep, if you want to grow food things, you want to keep the animals out of it, right? I mean, let's face it. If you got a garden of carrots, uh, the rabbits would uh, have a buffet. And uh, deer, deer can, you'd be shocked to see what a, a herd of deer can do to a, a vineyard. And he fenced it. And gathered out the stones thereof. Yeah, you want to you want to get the rocks out of your growing area. You know, plants don't grow with rocks. They just, you know, they might grow around it. So, and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine. What's the choicest vine? We'll find out. And built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Now, domesticated grapes are bred for flavor, whereas wild grapes, you know, just don't have the same. And now, verse 3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge... I pray you betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have I have not done it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. All right, so verse 5. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. Uh, you know, a hedge, like a, a fence, protects an area. And it's going to be taken away, and it's going to be eaten up. And break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. Briars and thorns. Keep that in mind, thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. You want to know the interpretation? Verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the the men of Judah. Did you catch that? For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. And who was crying? Those that had been dealt with who had been wronged by those who were unrighteous. Verse 8. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ears, said the Lord of hosts, of a truth many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard 
shall yield one bath, and the seed of an omer shall yield an ephah. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp, and the vial, the tabret, and pipe, and wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore hell, therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure. Don't worry, uh, hell's never going to be full, people. Hell's going to open her mouth. She's going to enlarge herself. Uh, there's not going to come a day when the Lord says, Oh, I'm going to throw you into hell. Oh, uh, Gabriel told me hell's full, so I'm going to have to make some other accommodations. Uh, no, that ain't going to happen, people. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat ones shall strangers eat. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as it were, with a cart rope. They say, Let him make speed and hasten his work, that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come, that we may know it. Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil. Isn't that where we're at today? If, if you're against the wicked sin of sodomy, what do they do? They call you a, a homophobe. And if you don't want the heathens in your land, they call you an a Islamophobe or a anti-Semite. You know? Uh, so, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justifieth the wicked for reward. In other words, a judge sitting on the bench that takes a campaign contribution so that a wicked client will win the judgment, which justifieth the wicked for reward and take away the righteous of the righteous from him, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as a fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he has stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them, and the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets, for all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. People, if you'll turn from your wickedness, the Lord has his hand out. And he's not looking for you to give him something. Except for maybe your prayers and asking him for forgiveness. 
if you're drowning in the sea and the Lord's got his hand out to, to pull you out from drowning, you better take hold of it because you are drowning. You're drowning in sin. So, verse 26, And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far, and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth, and behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary nor stumble among them, none shall slumber nor sleep, neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken, whose arrows are sharp, and all their bows bent, their horses' hooves shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry it away safe, and none shall deliver it. And in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold, darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened, darkened and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. Now, in Amos 5.20, now this is referring to those that are wicked. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark, and no brightness in it? Now, I think this has reference to the, um, the last trump. Sometimes, well, the Old Testament is a shadow of what's going to happen in the New Testament. But sometimes there will be a earthly shadow of things that has a heavenly meaning. For example, when the Assyrians and the Babylonians came and destroyed Israel and Judah, partly anyways, um, to just punish them for their wickedness, Contrast that when the armies of the Lord comes and finishes the end of this world. The old Lord has an army too. So let's read Joel chapter 2. Now we were talking about, uh, you know, darkness, the day of the Lord. Joel chapter 2 verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Remember that there are seven trumps in the book of Revelation for the tribulation. The seventh one is the last one, and that's when the um, resurrection occurs. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as this morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. All right, let's go back to Isaiah 5. Uh, let's talk about the vineyard. Now remember, the Lord says he planted a vineyard, and he, uh, in verse 7, it says, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. So let's take a look. Now in Mark 12, And he, Jesus, began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard, ah, and set an hedge about it, and digged a place for the wine fat, and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. Now what's a husbandman? You know, it's like a, a farmer. You know, the Lord gave his people to take care of his people. You know, that's why you have a king and you had the priests. 
They were supposed to take care of, they were supposed to rule for God in his place. So, verse 2. And at the season he sent to the husbandman a servant, and he might receive from the husbandman of the fruit of the vineyard. So these greedy people didn't want to give him anything, you know. Verse 3, And they caught him and beat him and sent him away empty. And again he sent unto them another servant, and at him they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. And again he sent another, and they ki and him they killed, and, ma and many others beating some and killing some. Now, that is referring to the prophets. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, Christ, right, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Isn't that what they did? They took Christ, killed him, and cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandmen and give the vineyard unto others. And have ye not read this scripture, the stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Contrast that, an earthly story with a heavenly application. When God the Father sends his army to get those husbandmen, look out. Those evil, wicked husbandmen. The wine, the vineyard farmers, right? All right, so these people were evil and wicked, and they didn't do things the way the Lord wanted them to. So now, what happened? Verse 5. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to the, my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor dig, but there shall come up briars and thorns. And there shall come up briars and thorns. Keep that in mind. All right? Briars and thorns. So who were the husbandmen of that uh, parable? The scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, the uh, the you know who's the Chosenites, yeah. All right, now, fire, briars and thorns. Let's go to Genesis chapter three. Now, Adam and Eve had just eaten of the tree of good and evil, and the Lord is not happy. So let's go to verse 17, Genesis 3, 17. And unto Adam he said, the Lord, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. In other words, you're going to have to work hard to get anything to grow. Verse 18, thorns also. There is those thorns. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So what was a curse? Thorns, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt 
thou return. There you go. Thorns were a curse from God. All right, let's take a look at Luke chapter 8. We're getting ready to close this uh, out. Verse 4. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. Now, this is Jesus speaking. Verse 5. Luke 8, 5. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns. And some fell among thorns. And the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And, and other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? In other words, Hey, uh, Jesus, uh, can you explain this to us? We don't get it. That's the Bob translation. And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. And these have no root. In other words, they don't have any root in themselves. Which for a while believe. And in time of temptation fall away. A parallel account of this says that uh, when persecution arises, they're offended. Uh, that's a parallel account. I mean, I'm reading Luke, but, you know, the same thing is in Mark and Matthew. So when persecution comes, they're offended. And, you know, uh, oh, you know, I'm going to have to suffer because of Christ uh, I didn't sign up for this, you know. I mean, go to a charismatic church. They think if you're not rich that, oh, you just didn't have faith to, to believe, you know. And for a while, believe, and in time of temptation, fall away. Let's read the parallel account, Mark 4. Uh, verse 16. And these are they likewise when, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are uh, sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it become unfruitful. So what are thorns? The cares of this world? deceitfulness or riches, the lusts of other things, choke the word, and it become unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold and some sixty, and some an hundred. And if you don't think fruit is important, read the second chapter of James. 
I mean, and people will argue and try to say that, oh, well, you know, you don't have to have, uh, you don't have to have any works to be saved. But the opposite way of looking at this is, if you don't have any works, you're probably not saved to, to begin with. I mean, works precedes salvation. Good works precedes salvation, period. I mean, even even the book of James in chapter 2 says, Believest thou that uh, believest thou in one God, thou doest well. Even the devils believe and tremble. And I've had people say that even the devils, because they believe in God, they're going to be saved. What? Was Judas Iscariot saved? He believes in God, absolutely. Now let's go to John chapter 19. Uh, Jesus had had his trial, and everybody wanted, well, all the Pharisees wanted Christ crucified. And Pilate, well, let's read. That's the background. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns. A crown of thorns. And put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. So they're mocking him. Instead of having a crown of gold, he's got a crown of thorns. And put it on his head and they put on him a purple robe. Now, what's purple? Purple was and is the color of royalty. Verse 3, And said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried. They cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh, against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he them, therefore unto them, to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And I think you know the rest of the story. All right, let's got one more thing to say here. All right, let's go to Je Hebrews chapter 6, and we'll close this out. Verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works 
or of faith toward God, or of, uh, of the doctrine of baptisms, or of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, or of eternal judgment. And this will we do, if God permit. For it is impossible for them who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, who were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open f shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns... But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Verse 13, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Can you imagine God saying, I swear to God, I swear by myself? Oh, yeah. Saying, surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and that and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest for ever, after the order of Melchizedek. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.